This morning, as you've already heard, we're going to be looking at the encounter of our Lord Jesus with the woman at the well. And we're not going to look, of course, at everything that he had to say, but we do want to focus in on what it is he says about those whom God is seeking. He is seeking those who will worship in spirit and in truth. And I'd like to read then a portion of this encounter, at least the most pertinent parts, verses 1 through 26. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 26. We read this. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews, but an hour is coming and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When that one comes, He will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Now, again, we want to focus on what it means that we are to worship the Lord, worship God in spirit, and we don't want to miss the connection between that and what Jesus said to the woman earlier, whoever believes in me from his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. What are these rivers of water? but the Spirit of God. Now, again, we're focusing on what it, what it is that the Lord tells us that He is looking for in us as He looks to and fro throughout the earth. Yes, the Lord tells us that that is what He is doing, though we know He doesn't really have to look physically. He doesn't have physical eyes like we do. He knows everything, but what is it He knows about us? And does what He know, is it something that will make us useful to Him or not. So we've been looking through the Scriptures to see what it is the Lord is looking for. 
And we've seen that it is really many different things, although they really can be summarized, I suppose, by one. We want to sort of differentiate all those different fruits of that one thing so we can understand better what it is that it produces. And by the way, that one thing is love. If we have love, we will have everything that we need. That love is the only thing that is different between us and an unbeliever is that love for God, that love for His holiness. And that's the reason why we began with that particular point that the Lord is looking for those who love Him with their whole being, with their whole heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that's what we ought to be seeking to be. He tells us He's looking for those who will love their neighbor as they love themselves as well. This love produces love for others, not just for other Christians, but for everyone who is near, for everyone who is in need. He's looking for those who also fear Him, who tremble at His Word enough to actually do His will. Remember, even though um, the Lord is not going to uh, judge us for our sins, He will discipline us, and that should create a healthy measure of respect and fear, which will lead to obedience. The Lord is looking for those who will humble themselves, who are not proud, who are not boastful, but are willing to be, become servants, as Jesus reminded us. The one who humbles himself the most to become the servant of all is the one who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And the Lord, of course, is looking for those who believe His Word, who believe it strongly enough to know that God actually takes this seriously. This is true. This is really what He says. This is really what He's looking for. This is what He creates in us. This is what He wants. And of course, they believe the rest of the Word of God as well, believe His promises and embrace those promises, believe that heaven exists and are on their way to that place, even as we see pilgrim or Christian and hopeful on their way to the celestial city. Basically, what the Lord is looking for are those virtues that are in His Son. The more we become like Jesus, the more visible we become. And let's not forget that that is the reason why the Lord actually saved us. He predestined us, Paul says, to be conformed to the image of His Son, to be made like Him, not outwardly in our appearance, but inwardly in our hearts. He cleanses our hearts by His Spirit so that we might become like Him, so that we might actually be more usable to Him. God's looking for someone He can use. Those are the ones on His radar. Now, in light of that, our passage this morning gives to us something else that God is looking for, what it is that He's seeking. And basically, our Lord tells us that He is looking for true worshipers. Now, that's why the Lord made us, is that we might worship Him. Now, realize in this world, that's the last thing that, that our attention is drawn to because the philosophy of the world is God doesn't exist the only thing that exists is this world, so people are into either worshiping themselves or worshiping other people, but not worshiping God. The Lord wants us to seek for His glory. He wants us to worship Him. He wants us to serve Him, and not ourselves and not others. And He really wants us to do this in a couple of different ways. I know sometimes we think that worship is what we do on Sunday when we gather together for the hour, the hour and a half in the morning and in the evening. And if we've done that, then we've done our duty. Well, it is true that this is worship. We call this public worship. And in this particular period of time, we certainly are seeking to honor the Lord and to glorify Him as we meet with Him on His holy day and with His people to thank Him and to praise Him and to bless Him and to express our love to Him. Certainly, that's what He wants. But we need to realize that He wants our entire lives to be that of worship. Let's not forget <clears throat> what we saw earlier in uh, Romans chapter 12, where Paul tells us that we are to worship the Lord by offering ourselves as living sacrifices, our whole selves, our whole lives to Him. There is that broader sense to our worship, where we are to honor God with everything that we think, everything that we desire, everything that we say, and everything that we do. 
in, in the great things we do and in the small things we do. Paul says, whatever we do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Now, we do have to ask ourselves in light of what God created us for, uh, you know, in, in light of uh, what He wants us to be doing, whether or not what we are doing is acceptable to Him. You know, sadly, there's a lot of worship that is going on, but it may fit more, I'm not saying necessarily here or in our lives, although if, if it is, we, we certainly need to repent of it, but a lot of worship going on in different places that is not really the kind of worship that the Lord is looking for because it falls more into the category of just going through the form without having the reality, without having the heart. So we need to ask the question, what is it that God is looking for in our worship, in our public worship, in the worship we offer to Him in our lives? What is it that He will accept? Well, Jesus tells us. I love these summary verses where Jesus makes it easy for us to kind of get a handle on, on what it is He wants us to be doing. Jesus tells us that God is seeking those who will worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now, as I've said this morning, we do want to focus on what it means to worship in spirit, what it means, what it doesn't mean. And this evening, we want to look at what it means to worship the Lord in truth. So let's consider first this morning that He is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit. And what does that mean? And to get a handle on this, I just want us to see it means simply two things. That where we worship doesn't matter. God isn't concerned about our locale. But how we worship does matter to Him. He is concerned about our hearts. Now, Again, this arises from the conversation that Jesus was having with the Samaritan woman. And he says, first of all, that where we worship is not important to God. He's not looking in particular places on Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem. The Samaritan woman, you know, she, as she perceives that Jesus is a prophet, the first thing she wants to do is settle an age-old question that existed between the Samaritans and the Jews. Where's the right place to worship? The Samaritan woman says, our fathers worshiped in, in this mountain. And by fathers, she meant not only the Samaritans themselves, but also the Jewish descendants that, or the Jewish fathers that they descended from. You realize the Samaritans were actually related to the patriarchs, to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Uh, this morning and this evening, we're going to go through a little bit of history of the Samaritans, but let me just tell you right now, if you don't remember, that the Samaritans were actually half-bloods. They were, you might say, mutts as far as the, uh, the Jews were concerned, so they didn't think too highly of them. Uh, they were the result of what we might call a partial relocation plan by the king of Assyria. Remember, the northern kingdom of Israel was first taken into captivity before the southern kingdom was, and the northern kingdom was taken by Assyria. They happened to have a plan in those days to try to disorient the people they conquered so they wouldn't close ranks again and continue to fight against them. And the way they did that was they, they took people from the land they conquered and they moved them to other lands, and they took people from the other lands they conquered and moved them into their lands. And in doing so, they relocated them. You, you no longer have your country, you no longer have something to fight over. Well, when they did this, they didn't take all the Jews, but they did take a good number of them, and they brought in a number of people who weren't Jews. And of course, as they intermingled, they had children that were half Jewish and half pagan. And you know what the Jews thought about the Gentiles? Well, they thought even less of those who were half Jews and half Gentiles. Well, over the years, of course, um, and we're going to look a little bit more uh, at uh, this this evening, they developed their own worship that was separate from the Jews, and they worshiped on Mount Gerizim. That was the mountain that the woman was pointing to, and as a matter of fact, where they were standing, they could see the mountain very clearly, and they, she said, what about this mountain? Is it on this mountain, or is it in Jerusalem? You know, it's funny how... Traditions develop over the years when you want something badly enough and you want to justify what you're doing, you begin to accept just about anything uh, that will 
vindicate what you're doing. And so different traditions developed about Mount Gerizim that led them to conclude that this must be the place where God wants us to worship. Now, a couple of these things were actually quite spurious. They believed that when the Lord flooded the whole world, that that one mountain stayed above the flood, which is interesting because the Bible does say that every high mountain under heaven was covered. But they believed Mount Gerizim wasn't covered, so this must be God singling out this mountain. They also believed that it was on that mountain that Abraham offered Isaac, which of course he didn't follow through, but the place where he was going to offer him. But we know that both of those things aren't true. What was true, though, was that Abraham did live there for a a short period of time, that he did build an altar there, that when Jacob lived in the land, he actually bought this land from Hamor, and he built an altar there as well, and that this mountain was the place where the tribes of Israel, when they came into the land and God divided the tribes, some on Mount Gerizim and some on Mount Ebal, and they were to pronounce blessings and curses that it was on the Mount Gerizim that the blessings were pronounced, which means that this was a special mountain. So, prophet, this is the mountain where we believe that we ought to worship, but you say in Jerusalem is where we ought to worship. And of course, that's what the Jews believed, and the Jews were right, because that is where God commanded the temple was to be built, That was the place where he wanted the sacrifices to be made. That was the place he wanted all Israel to gather to him three times a year. So you're wrong, Samaritan. The Jews are right in this case. Jerusalem is the right place. But I want you to notice something, Jesus says, that even though that was the case, it is no longer. He says to her in verse 21, woman, believe me, An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. And then in verses 23 and 24, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, our Lord is telling us that with the coming of the new covenant, that there is a remarkable change taking place, that it's not going to be a matter of location any longer, but it's going to be a matter of heart. And it's not that heart didn't matter in the old covenant. It did. But most of the people who worship the Lord in the old covenant were just simply going through the forms And they really did not love the Lord. As a matter of fact, you see the author to the Hebrews points that out as a matter of contrast between the old covenant and the new. With the coming of the new covenant, Jesus is saying it doesn't matter any longer where we worship. All that matters now is how we worship. God isn't looking to Jerusalem to find the true few worshipers that are are actually there. But He's looking throughout the world for those who have hearts that are His. Jesus says that God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit. Now, we need to come to grips with what He's talking about here because, you know, we could come away with perhaps several different ideas, and I've already given away what I believe it to be. I don't think that the Lord here is, first of all, telling us that God is the Holy Spirit. I mean, some people understand it in that way. The Holy Spirit is God, but he's not pointing out that the Holy Spirit is God in this passage. Uh, I think he is saying rather something about the character and the quality of God when he says God is spirit. He's referring to God's moral nature, his holiness, his righteousness, that which makes him beautiful that which is the opposite of flesh, and the reason why those who are of flesh cannot approach Him, because He is pure holiness, pure righteousness. He is one who has a perfect love for what is right. James tells us that in God there is no variation or shifting shadow. 
And this means that those who approach him have to approach him in a particular way. It's not a matter of location. Now, we've already seen that uh, it's also not a matter of form. It's not a matter of rituals. Even the Jews who approached him through the ceremonial law, which is the way that God actually commanded that they approach him, still would not be received by him because they didn't do it with the right heart. The Lord tells us that He's not going to accept us if we speak many words. He says the pagans think that if they say things over and over again that God's going to hear them, but no, He's not interested in that. He's not interested in traditions. We've already seen that, especially those traditions that can't contradict His Word. And if we ask the question today, is God concerned in Christian celebrities? Is He concerned in, in churches that are entertainment-driven? All of these things to Him are meaningless. What matters to Him is spirit. Now, I'm not going to say that form doesn't matter. We're going to see this evening that we are to worship God in truth as well as in spirit. But, but even if we have the right form, it's still not going to be acceptable to Him unless we worship Him in spirit. God is spirit, so we must worship Him in spirit. Well, what exactly does Jesus mean? Well, I believe He's referring to the Holy Spirit. We might be tempted to say that what, what He has in mind here is the fact that, he, that we are to worship Him from our spirits. And in a certain sense, that's true, but we need to realize that it wouldn't be acceptable to Him unless the Spirit of God is in union with our spirit, producing His particular fruits. I should just note here that the Bible says that we do have a body and we have a soul, and that soul is basically the same as our spirit. Some people believe the soul and the spirit are distinct, but I think the way that the Bible uses them interchangeably means that it's really one thing. We have matter and we have spirit. Now, that spirit is really the part of us that, that is our personality. It contains our hearts, not our physical beating heart, but our affections. It contains our reason. That's the reason why we're different than the animals, is that we can contemplate our own existence, we can think things through. It also contains our will. But you see, if we don't have the Spirit of God in us, if we're unconverted, then we really can't approach God in our spirit, as it were, because our heart is polluted with sin, our affections are evil. We want evil things. We want things that God hates, and we don't want what God wants. Because of that, we reason wrongfully, uh, even as uh, Paul says that the unbelievers look at the creation. And even though there's, there's so much evidence out there to so leave them without excuse, unconverted man will suppress all that information and try to hide it and worship the creation rather than the Creator because their hearts are evil. An evil heart will make us use our reason wrongly and it will also cause us to choose sin rather than righteousness. And if that's the case, how can we possibly approach God? When everything about us is offensive to Him, He will not receive us. Our heart has to be changed by the Spirit of God before what we do is going to be acceptable to Him. But that's exactly why Jesus Christ came into the world in the first place. That's the reason why He lived and the reason why He died was so that He might be able to give His Holy Spirit to those whom the Lord or the Father would have Him give it so that we would be able to approach God in the way that is honoring to Him. Now again, coming back to that contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, remember the author to the Hebrews quoting Jeremiah says, in the Old Covenant, the law was written on tablets of stone. And as long it was, as it was only on stone, it couldn't affect the hearts of men because it was outside of them. And because of that, the people of God, the ones that God had actually separated to Himself, the Jews, for the most part, didn't know Him. They didn't walk in His ways, and God says, I did not care for them. That, by the way, is one of the reasons why 
A.D. 70 or 70 A.D. came about when God destroyed Jerusalem and He destroyed the temple and took the kingdom away from them because they may have honored Him with their lips, but their heart was far from them. The Old Covenant, there were people saved in the Old Covenant, but there weren't that many. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the seashore, the prophet says it's only the remnant that would be saved. God says to Elijah, I have reserved for myself, you know, was it 7,000 or 5,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal out of millions. Now, the Old Covenant couldn't save. There were relatively few that actually embraced salvation through that method. But in the New Covenant, God gives His Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God takes that law and He writes it on the heart so that we will love God, so that our hearts will be changed, so that we will use our reason to uh, reveal God and to see Him and glorify Him. We will choose what is good in His sight rather than what is dishonoring to Him. You know how Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, doesn't matter what we do, if it doesn't have love, it's not pleasing to Him. But with the Holy Spirit of God in our hearts, we can do what is pleasing to Him because we love Him, though what we do is still polluted. We have Jesus Christ as our mediator who makes what we do acceptable to Him. So we get back to our point again. What is it that God is looking for? He is looking for those who will worship Him in spirit this is the only thing that is acceptable to Him. The worship that we give to Him has to be motivated by the Spirit of God. That's the kind of worshiper that He is looking for. Well, now that we understand that, we need to ask the question, are we that kind of worshiper? Is the Lord actually looking for you this morning? Well, here's a few diagnostic questions perhaps we can ask ourselves to help figure out uh, why it is we're doing what we're doing. We might ask this question, first of all, why did you come here this morning? Now, we do need to recognize that you came, that's, that's a part of the form that God wants, and that's good. He wants you to come to worship. He's looking for somebody who will actually come to the worship services and worship Him. He tells us quite plainly in His Word in Hebrews 10.25, that we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It's important that we be here. But the question is, why did you come? Did you come because of that commandment? Did you come because you love God? That's good. But if we come for any other reason, then it's not what God is looking for, okay? Uh, some people come to church, as you know, and, and not this church in particular because we don't have that much of this here, uh, to be entertained, okay? There are a lot of churches that are entertaining, right? <laughs> they have entertaining things. You ask somebody, what do you like about that church? And they'll say, well, I love the worship band. I love the songs. I love the music. And, you know, they like to sing to that kind of thing, and, and that thrills their heart. But they're in love with the music, maybe, and not really in love with God, now, I do think that worship should be entertaining, but it needs to be entertaining at a different level, doesn't it? It needs to be entertaining because we love the one that we're worshiping. Well, sometimes we come to church because we like to socialize. We like the people who are here. We like our friends, and this is the only chance we get to see them, so we come primarily to meet with our friends, and there's nothing wrong with coming for that reason. But if that's the only reason you came for, that's not what God is looking for. He wants you to come here because you love Him, because you want to thank Him for all the good things that He has done for you during the week, because you want to honor Him for who and what He is. Remember, we looked at um, that psalm we used for the call to worship, and we saw several of the reasons why the psalmist was thanking God and why, why he loved Him. Well, he loved God because he was great and powerful and knew all things, and because he could effect things in this world for his good. We need to love him for those things, but really we need to love him for something more than that. I don't know if you noticed again at the end of that psalm, Lord, you've given to us your ordinances. 
his commandments, those things that express his holiness and his love of righteousness. You haven't given those to any other nation but to our nation And Lord, we thank you for that. Now, that's expressing the thing that we ought to love God for more than anything else, His truth, His holiness. We should love Him because He hates sin and because He loves righteousness. Let me ask you the question this morning, is that why you love Him? And is that why you came here, is to worship the God who loves what is good and what is right because you love that too? That is what the Spirit of God produces. The Spirit of God doesn't produce, although He does to some degree, an appreciation for the power of God. And certainly He draws our attention to the goodness of God. But you can be unconverted and still admire His power and see all of His goodness And acknowledge that and say that that's good. But you cannot, without the Spirit of God, look at His holiness and say, I love that, that's attractive. That is the change of the Holy Spirit, the one, the work that He does in your heart that makes you love Christ and want to come to Christ so that you'll be saved. And it's what makes you want to come and worship Him. Is that why you came this morning? Did you come to worship God for His holiness? Well, if that's why you came, then God is looking for you because He can use you. Now, that's worship more narrowly. What about worship more broadly? Why are you doing the things that you do with your life? Are you doing these things because you love Him? Again, you know, we can even do right things for the wrong motives, but we can also do a lot of wrong things. We need to ask ourselves, are we doing the wrong things? Well, obviously, if if we're doing those things, then we can't love God in those things. We need to do away with those things. But what about the things we would look at and say, these are good things? Are you doing those things because you love Him? For instance, we all have to work in order to get money to live, but, you know, and we need, we certainly need that money, but are you working just for the money? You know, the Lord tells us in His Word that when we serve our masters and all of us who are working are are serving a master unless we happen to be self-employed, in which case we have to see ourselves as being under the master. But are you doing it just for the money? Are you doing it just to make ends meet? Or are you doing it to love the Lord? You see, the Lord wants you to do it to please Him. When the Lord tells you that you are to love others, to love your wife, to love your husband, to love your brothers and your sisters, to love your children or your friends, why are you loving them? Are you loving them because He commands it or are you loving them because, well, when I love them, they love me back. You know, I get, I get good things as long as I kind of play the part or maybe I really do care about them and so forth. But the question is, Are you loving them because you want to show God that you love Him because He commands you to love them? You see, there's differing motives that we can have in everything we do. And is it self-motivated? Am I looking just at self or am I looking at what is truly pleasing to God because I love Him? Well, if you are loving others because that's what God calls you to do and you you love Him so much you want to do that, God is looking for you because He can use you. Now, you know, having um, teenagers in the house, um, young people, I I realize one of the things that's on their hearts a lot, and I'm sure on everybody's hearts, especially when you're young, is all the questions about what am I going to do in the future, right? Where am I going to go to college? What am I going to do for a living? Where am I going to live? Whom am I going to marry? Although some of those questions are already answered. Now, when you ask these questions, are you making your choices based upon what you think is best for you or how you might best love and serve God with your life? You see, that's the question you need to be asking. Because God says that whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all to His glory. In other words, worship Him in everything you think, everything you say, everything you intend, everything you actually do. And that includes big decisions like 
where I'm going to go to college, where I'm going to live, what I'm going to do with my life, what, am I, you know, what, what kind of work am I going to do? God wants you to do those things that you know would be pleasing to Him because you love Him. If that is what you are basing your decisions on, then God is looking for you. Now, again, I want you to recognize, as I'm sure you do, and we all recognize this, that as we talk about these things and we realize what God wants, we know that we never do it perfectly the way He wants us to. We know that our hearts are divided. We know they're not perfect. But one thing we also know is the more we have of the Spirit of God in our souls, the more we will love God and the more we will do what we do for His glory. And as we do that, the more we're going to show up on His radar, the more God's going to take note of us and use us for His kingdom. Jesus says God is Spirit. He is seeking those who will worship Him in spirit, narrowly in public worship, broadly with their lives. He's looking for those who are filled with the Spirit, who really love Him and want to honor Him in all that they do. I think the point of what Jesus is saying here is simply this, be filled with the Spirit of God. How do you do that? Immerse yourself in in the Word of God. It makes a difference. It is the bread of life. It feeds your soul. Read it. Meditate on it. Apply it. Respond to it in love. Let the Spirit of God illumine its pages. The more, again, you have of the Spirit, the more you're going to love the Word, the more you're going to be in it. Discipline yourselves to pray more. We all need to spend more time with God. And the more we do, the more we'll be filled with the Spirit. Cut off those things that feed sin and quench the Spirit of God. Stay on the narrow path. Don't turn to the left or to the right because every time you do, you lose some of the Spirit's gracious influence. Spend time with other Christians. Don't spend your time with the people of the world unless, of course, you're trying to evangelize them. But spend time with Christians, and when you spend time with Christians, talk about the things of the Lord and try to build each other up. Don't just talk about the things of the world that you could talk about with people who don't know the Lord. Now, if you do these things and if you seek the Lord earnestly through these things, you will have more of the Spirit's influence. You will be filled with more love and you will better be able to worship in the Spirit, and you will be more visible to God. Now, this evening, I want us to see what it means to worship God in truth, because God wants us to worship not only in spirit and in truth, and as we look at that, we'll see more of what it means to worship in spirit, because if you have the Spirit of God in you, you will want to do things the Lord's way. You'll want to worship the true God, you're going to want to worship God His way, and you're going to want to do it um, sincerely from the hearts. So we're going to look at that this evening. And just in closing, I just want to say this, that if you answered no to all these questions, if you didn't really come here because you love God, if you don't really do the things you do in life because you love Him, but you're doing them from some other reason, you, you need to understand that God is still looking for you but He's looking for you for another reason. He wants you to turn from your sins, to trust His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be saved from hell. And then He wants you in trusting Jesus to follow Him and use your life to honor Him. If you haven't done that, then do that now as God gives you ability. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's